tonight, let me get my board over here, number six, the number of man, as Dan has reminded me, we find that number six is harvest. Can't really see that, can you? My marker's about out of that color anyway. It's harvest, and I'll, I'll do something else in a minute because I'm going to, I'm going to, if you would, in the office is a roll of paper towels on the refrigerator, if you'll get those and bring to me. Because I'm going to erase this and I'm going to do something else in it, then I'll put this back up there for next week. But I want you to see that tonight is harvest. And I thought about harvest. I thought, well, what can we really say about harvest except let's get it? <laughs> <laughs> and then I filled up two pages of notes on how to get it and why we don't get it. Thank you, brother. Would you race that for me, sir? You're doing a good job. I don't care what Sherry says about you. Servant's heart right there. Um, let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for your blessing, and I thank you for what you're teaching us in doing money your way. And I pray tonight, Lord, that you will guide our discussion again and the blessings of God will be here. And anoint, anoint us, Lord. Anoint me to teach this. And I thank you for it. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Okay. I thought, harvest, you know, what, what can you see, really say about harvest? And so as I began to read and, and look at some different things, and uh, like I said, I wound up filling up almost two pages of notes. But the law of seed time and harvest is a physical law. Everybody agree with that? I mean, if you plant something, it's going to grow. If you, if you treat it correctly, if you water it and, and do the things that you're supposed to do. Uh, how many of y'all are, have a really, really good green thumb at growing things? How many of you kill everything you grow? You killed an air fern one time, and you can't kill those, right? <laughs> but if you plant something, 99% of the time, unless catastrophe happens it's going to grow right okay if you, you just watch after it now you do have to protect it and we'll get into some of those things but this is a a physical law and we talked about the seed uh in giving at link number uh three and so giving we've already covered that so we're not going to cover that tonight because you already know the principle of giving and what all is behind it giving with a cheerful heart and so on and so forth but what about the harvest? What about the harvest? How many of you have ever been disappointed with the harvest that you've gotten? Anybody? All right, let's be honest with ourselves. We've been disappointed with it. Has your harvest been what you thought it would, it would be when you planted it? Not always? Well, then, have we learned how to reap the harvest? Because there are principles involved in reaping the harvest just like there are principles involved in sowing the, sowing the seed, okay? And it doesn't just happen. The farmer just doesn't wake up one day and all of a sudden the harvest is there and he says, oh no, what do I do? He has a method that he has to go through in order, in order to gather the harvest, right? There's things he has to do to gather the harvest. Now, he all throughout the process of planting and growing, he has done things to, to help speed the harvest along and get it to the place where it could be harvested. So Mark 4, 26 through 29 gives us a, kind of a background scripture for this particular portion of putting in the sickle. And he said, The kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground and should sleep by night and rise by day, and the seed should sprout and grow, he himself does not know how. For the earth yields crops by itself, first the blade, then the head, after that the full grain in the head. But when the grain ripens, immediately he puts in the sickle, because the harvest has come. We don't know how. To use the sickle. We don't know how to use the sickle. We th the harvest is out there. But we don't know how to gather it. Does that make sense? 
Okay, now then, I'm, I want to show you another principle. See if I can find one of these things that works here to kind of illustrate something for you. I think this one might. Let's see here. Yeah, it will. Pink. Anyway, let's say that each one of these dots represents a seed that you've sown, okay? And this is, this is you sowing. You sow a seed here. Then here. Then later on you sow another seed down here. See all this space between these seeds? You know what you're planning for? You're planning for lack in these spaces. You're, abs- you're planning for lack and not enough. Because you've scattered seed. Now this seed's going to grow. This one's going to grow. But what happens if you become a consistent giver? You plant a seed, 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 seed, you're consistently. Now, it doesn't matter what kind of seed, how big or whatever, because we're talking about seed money, okay, in this case, because that's what this study's about. You plant a seed, you plant a seed. Well, look at there. You've got a row. Now, you continue Pretty soon, you've got another row. And then you've got another row. And pretty soon, you've planted a whole field. You don't have these breaks in there. You've planted a whole field. And then that field turns into another field because of your consistent in giving. So what you've done now, you've got a harvest. Some of this was planted 10 years ago. And then as you, then you come up to today. So you plant, 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 plant. So some of this seed, as you continue to plant, is already grown and mature. And the one you just planted today is not ready yet. So how many of you have planted seed in the past, but you haven't harvested it yet? Okay. Now then. If you, pl- if you sow this way, then this is how your, your harvest is going to look. God's not mad at you. God hasn't looked at you and said, you know, well, I'm not going to bless you. But the way you planted is the way you reap your harvest. So once you start becoming consistent... And some people aren't consistent, sometimes for good reasons, and sometimes for not so good reasons. But most people will say, I'm going to try that given thing, and they'll give it a shot for about two or three weeks. And they don't see a harvest like this. They see a harvest like this because they're reaping off of the way they've sown. And so then they stop, and then they go, Another while, and they say, well, I'll give it a shot again. I'll try it one more time. What if the farmer planted his seed this way? Would he ever make a living? He'd be hungry, wouldn't he? We'd be hungry. The farmer would never, ever have a whole field because he only planted when he felt like it or when he had it and not when it was a sacrifice for him. So that's part of the reason that our harvest is not what we want it to be is because we want want the harvest, but we don't want to sow the seed. We expect God should just give us a harvest without a seed. (laughs) We expect Him to give us a harvest, and we haven't planted anything. And it just doesn't work that way. I mean, I'm sorry as I can be. Yes, Angela, let me let you ask a question, but we want to hear the question or make a comment. Okay, it's, it should be on now. Oh, I had an illustration. Um, years ago, they um, went to the Chinese people, and they were going to um, show them how to harvest potatoes so that they could maintain, you know, have a, a staple uh, for them to eat. And so they showed them, you know, how to plant potatoes and harvest them. And 
um, as an end result, they decided that we're going to keep the biggest potatoes for ourselves and then we're going to plant the little ones. And then what happened was the potato crop, when they would harvest the potatoes, kept getting smaller and smaller and smaller because they weren't giving the biggest portion. They weren't giving the planting the big potatoes. They were planting the little. And so they were actually reaping exactly what they sowed. Exactly. And so they had to explain to them, no, it doesn't, you can't do that. You've got to plant the big so you can reap. Exactly. Exactly. The Bible tells us, God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man sows, that shall he reap. So, what's your field look like? How have you sown? If you say, well, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a giver, then you know what? You've got a whole field out there that's probably ready to be harvested. And so that's what this is going to be about tonight, is how do I get that harvest? So, reaping requires action, just like planting. He said, put in the sickle. You see how that is an action that's doing something. Put in the sickle. How many of y'all know what a sickle is? What is a sickle? Okay, tool for cutting, for reaping. Okay, cutting down wheat or whatever they're going to harvest. Okay. Does that tool, does it just do it automatically, or do they have to get out there and, and, and go do it? How many of y'all have ever picked cotton? I have. As a small child, I picked cotton. And uh, I thought it was going to be a blast till I got blisters on my fingers and, and where, the, where the cotton bowls would, and had those sharp edges on them would cut your finger, fingertips. I've seen my mom come in from the cotton field with her fingers bleeding. And uh, we would pick cotton, and uh, a lot of times on Saturdays during the fall. Matter of fact, in Arkansas, and probably in Alabama too, back when I was in first grade, in that time, they would even dismiss school for a week or sometimes even two weeks in the fall because most kids lived on farms, and they would help their parents harvest the crops. And so school would be out, and then they would come back and go to school. Because all the kids worked on the farm. Can you imagine if our kids had to work on a farm today? (laughs) I think it would look like this. You think it would look like this? (laughs) Or worse? (laughs) Might see one seed, huh? Uh, I, I I would see parents out there that would have tiny babies, newborn babies. And you know where those babies would be? They would have them tied to their cotton sack. And they would drag them along behind on the cotton sack and pick cotton and put in cotton. In the, and the baby would be asleep on the cotton sack going through the field. Amazing. Amazing what people had to do back in that day. But that's how they made their money. They had to do that. So... I've, I've drawn this mental picture for you when, on, your, on your notes in the introduction, number five, the mental picture. So you get one, then two. Eventually, you, uh, one seed turns into a row. A row turns into a field, and then a field turns into another field. Some are old plants, ready to be harvested. Some are new, not quite mature yet. So the question comes down to this. Have you skipped a season of planting? Wherever you skipped planting, then you have scheduled a time of lack. Yay, aren't you happy? (laughs) You have scheduled a time of lack. So here's how we harvest. First of all, there's two types of harvest. There's the daily harvest and the exceptional harvest. Now, you have to have faith for both of these. Faith for the daily harvest means this, okay? This is simply put, we lean on the foundation scriptures for God being our Heavenly Father and providing basic needs every day. Now, where do we find this? We find this in Matthew 6, 33. Okay, Robbie, if you'd put Matthew 6, 33. You probably need to read this entire chapter uh, to get the whole gist of this. But seek first the king- kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. And that's talking about don't worry about what you should eat, what you should drink, what you should wear. I'm sorry, what now? Our daily bread, the Lord's Prayer, our daily bread. There's so many scriptures you can draw from to get this particular foundational teaching in you. And this is a very, very important foundational teaching. 
don't ever dismiss the Lord's Prayer as something that's not important because everything you need in life is in that Lord's Prayer, from praise and worship all the way to your daily needs, okay? So it would be good to learn the Lord's Prayer and make it a part of your life on a daily basis. And so then we find Philippians 4, 19, and somebody can probably quote that, and my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Now I want you to, Robbie, I don't have this scripture in there, but I want you to go to Hebrews chapter 5, I believe it's the last verse, and and chapter 6, the first verse uh, of Hebrews chapter 5. And I want to look. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age, that is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Say, what in the world does this mean? Therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go into perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. Now, what I want to draw in a, in kind of a, use this as a, as a, as a backdrop for, for something here. You've got to, you've got to get, a, where you're not worried about repentance and works, okay, in this scripture. This scripture, you say, what does this have to do with money? In this scripture, he's saying, you need to be settled in knowing the foundational things of Christ. Everybody in here needs to have that settled. You cannot move on to the deeper things of God until you get the basic foundations of of Christianity into your spirit. It becomes the same thing with your faith in trusting God for daily provision. It has to become second nature. It has to become second nature to you. You're not going to grow in expecting God for the miraculous until you get down and have in your spirit the basic foundation of of believing and trusting God for your daily provision. Give us this day our daily bread. Does God, does God mean that? He does. But how many Christians every day are wondering how they're going to have their daily bread? And they worry at night. They sit up at night wondering. You see, and so this has to become some of your uh, very foundational and second nature to us that we've got that. We've got that down. We've got those scriptures in our heart. We got them in our spirit. And if the enemy ever tries to come to us to bring worry or to to cause us to fret, we bring these scriptures back to him. And we tell him, no, God promised me my daily bread. He promised me daily bread. So we establish a relationship with God around the fact that every day we get to eat. Boy, I thought that'd get a big old amen. (laughs) We establish a relationship with God around the fact that every day we get to eat without concern or worry. Every day we get to eat without concern or worry. And if you're not to that place yet, then this is where you need to start in getting these foundational scriptures in you to where you can quote them, and you have them in your mind, and you can actually look at the the enemy, and you can say, "Uh uh-uh, my God said I'm going to get to eat every day. My baby's not going to go hungry. I'm not going to go hungry. God has promised to supply my every need. As long as the devil can hoodwink you, he will. He will. He's not going to feel sorry for you. The devil is not going to feel sorry for you and say, oh, well, I guess I'll have somebody come by and bring you a loaf of bread today. No, he wants you to get to the place where you don't trust God for anything. That's his specialty. Boy, God's blessing that one, but he's sure isn't blessing me. Boy, the devil loves to use that against God's people, and he'll use it all the time. He'll make you so jealous and green with envy of somebody else's blessings that you'll shake your fist in the hand of God and say, Why isn't that me? Is that coming from God? Is that coming from the devil? And the devil's going to keep doing that as long as you keep submitting to it. He will wear you out with it. He will wear you out. How many of y'all been there and done that and bought the t-shirt? Yep, 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 yep. We've all done that, hadn't we? So these have to become 
something ex- exceptional. Faith now is for the exceptional harvest. So do, we, do you know the difference between the daily harvest? All of us should be enjoying a daily harvest. Everybody in here should be enjoying the daily harvest. And you shouldn't even be having to think about it. When God promised manna to the, to the Israelites, they didn't even have to think about it, did they? They got up every morning and it was there. As long as they followed the instruction, it was always there. They tried to get too much, it rotted on them. <laughs> they had to follow the rules, didn't they? They had to follow the rules. So, learn these principles. Now then, okay, what about the things that come along that are extra? Your air conditioner went out. The motor went out on your car. You don't have enough money in the bank for that. How many of y'all been there? Okay. So how do, you, how do you believe God for that? Well, first of all, if you can't believe him for the daily stuff, you're going to have a hard time believing him for the exceptional stuff. You know what you're going to be waiting on? You're going to be waiting on somebody else to do for you what you refuse to do for yourself. Did I just say that? You're going to be waiting on somebody else to do for you what you refuse to do for yourself, and that is trust God. Now, sometimes the exceptional harvest, this is miracle money for occasional needs that we might want to call it, and this requires action. You can't just sit back and wait for it to happen. One of the worst things that Christians do is get lazy. Well, I've prayed. What did James James tell us? Faith without works is dead. D-E-A-D, dead. D-O-A, dead on arrival. Faith without works. So you, can you imagine how foolish it would be for the farmer to plant his seed and go in and pray every day during May, June, July, August, September, October, and November, and come the end of November, go out and look in his barn, and it's empty. And he could look at God and say, but I prayed every day. But my barn is empty. And God says, you planted your seed, but you didn't water it. You planted your seed, but you didn't work it. Your seed came up and it, was the, and, and it was out there in the field and you let it lay there and rot because you didn't go out. But I prayed. Folks, don't use prayer for an excuse not to do something. Don't use prayer as an excuse not to do what God has told you to do. The farmer lost it because he prayed, but he did nothing else. Legs on your prayers, whatever you want to put it at. It's you've got to, you've got to, it requires action. The sickle signifies that number two in the chain was W O R K. Work. You've got to work your faith. Danny, what does it mean to work your faith? To work your faith, step out and do something. Step out and do something. You do what God shows you, do what the Word says, do what needs to be done. Just get up and, and take the initiative. Take the initiative, okay? Do it. Do it. You've got to do something. So it's not just good enough to sit back and pray, is it? Prayer is important. Certainly, I'm not telling y'all not to pray. I bet you that farmer goes in there and prays, but he also works. Yes. I was reminded about something in my Bible studies uh, is that in, uh, when the Islam, Islam took over the Eastern Church in 700 A.D., they took in 30 years what took the church 700 to build because the Eastern Church would have rather prayed than fought. Rather prayed than fought. In the Revolutionary War in this country, 
who was, when, this, when this country uh, had its revolution and broke away from, from uh, the British, most, they got most of their recruits out of the church because the church prayed, but they also fought. Now, again, I'm not advocating don't pray. We need to pray. We need to have prayer meetings. We need to come together and pray. But we have to also do something with those prayers. Okay, so we find here that we sometimes this prayer then requires, letter A, it sometimes it requires asking, receiving, and thanking God. Sometimes because you have planted well, it might just be a matter of you asking, receiving, and thanking God. Because you've learned the principle. And your faith is at the point that you just ask. I know people right now, they just, they just say, God, I need, I need 1800 extra dollars. And they don't worry about it. Because they've planted. You know what? It's not two or three days. Somebody just, just comes up and says, I was praying and God told me to give you $1,800. It happens. Okay. Yeah. It's not cheap, is it, brother? Yeah. Right. The money came. Exactly. I, I bet you, now, Brad, I haven't known you and Teresa in a very long time. I've known her longer than you. And I'm not putting you on the spot, but I would just imagine from knowing you and knowing your character and having gotten acquainted with you all, I bet you you all are pretty good sowers into the kingdom, faithful in sowing. That's why it came. And it came from places I, I never expected for it to come. That's why it came. From people I didn't even know. You had a harvest out there, and it was time to reap it. You needed that harvest at that time, and that harvest was ready to come in. Because it was a t- at a time when you needed it. You've got a harvest out there. 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 You've got a harvest. Everybody in here has a harvest. Some has a bigger harvest than others because they've been giving longer than others and they've learned the principle longer than others. But if you've just started giving in the last three weeks, you've got a harvest. And God's always on top. You've got a harvest. Say, I have a harvest. I just need to learn how to use the sickle. How many of y'all want your harvest to rot in the field? I don't want my harvest to rot in the field so I can stay in here and pray. Or I can get up and go collect it. Or I can do both. Sometimes it means declaring God's word. Okay, maybe you're not at that place where you just pray and receive. Maybe you've got to get a little bit stronger and you've got to begin to quote Scripture. Maybe you've got to speak directly to the thing of need and call it in using your God-given authority. In other words, let's take Brad and Teresa's example. Uh, They had a need. And so, I don't know how he prayed, but he may have just said, God, we got to have this. And I'm calling in the resources to get this paid for. And... Because of the authority that God has placed in him and given him and Teresa, they were able to call it in with the authority that God had given them. And because they had been the giver, now the harvest comes in. See, all this, these, these seven principles, do you see how they all just work together? You've got to have all seven of these. We'll get to this, the next one. The last one next week is wisdom. But anyway, we're gonna, we, so we're finding here that it all has to work together. So you may have to get rough with the devil. How many of y'all can get rough with the devil? Or how many of y'all let the devil get rough with you? Mm-hmm. The devil's been on me all week, bless his holy name. <laughs> I've heard people say that before. <laughs> Sometimes it means making a plan and moving forward in faith before anything is ever seen. Real faith moves forward as if it's so. In other words, calling those things that aren't as though they are. I see Sherry's hand coming up. This is going to be good. Well, when I grew up, we didn't have very much money, and I remember family saying that they didn't have food, but they set the table for dinner, and somebody brought something. Amen. That's, that's it. Yeah. And also, uh, George Mueller, uh, for those of you who may not know, he had an orphanage, and 
millions of dollars came through his hands. But he never told anybody else when he had a need. He always went to God, prayed, and he had a bunch of kids to, to feed, and sometimes there would be nothing left. And the workers would come say, we don't have anything for the next meal. And he'd say, okay. And he would go pray without asking people for help. Sometimes, you know, a bread truck or something, a potato truck might break down in front of them and they got to get the food or whatever. But millions of dollars because he just believed and asked God. Amen. Amen. Well, there's a, how many of y'all know where Restoration Ranch is? Not the one behind our church, but the one up in Tuscumbia. Okay. Restoration Ranch. They had a need. They needed a new lawnmower for the, for the property. Theirs was torn up. So that night at the, where they gather everybody together at their prayer meeting and, and devotionals, they told them that they needed to pray for a lawnmower. And then they went ahead and told the lawnmower team to be ready tomorrow morning at 6 a.m. to go outside and be prepared to mow. Well, those, those guys were saying, but we don't have a lawnmower. They said, that's okay, just be ready in the morning at 6 o'clock, come downstairs, be out there where you normally gather, and we're going to mow the yard. You know what, when they got up the next morning, you know what they found at the front door? A brand new lawnmower. They didn't even know where it came from. There wasn't even a note left. Brand new lawnmower. They called us, this, and now this happened about 10 years ago. Is that not incredible? They prepared for the blessing. When they set the table, they was preparing for the blessing. Can you imagine somebody in 2017 not having anything in the house to eat, but they go ahead and set the table, put the plates and the forks and the napkin and the glasses and all this stuff, and they set it there, and the kids come in and say, but what are we going to eat? And the mom says, I don't have a clue. But what if the mom says, we're going to have food because God's going to provide, then, or the dad, and they're teaching those children. And, and that is a step of faith. You're, put, you're putting faith in action. You see, you're putting the sickle to the harvest by setting the table. What is it tonight that you need, that you're praying for, and what are you doing about it? Are you just praying, or are you setting the table for the blessing? Are you, are you putting your faith in action and preparing for that blessing? Well, which one was it? Tell it again, because some of the people might not have been here. Okay, when our daughter was a teenager, she wanted to go to Brownsville with the kids from church, and there wasn't a space for her. They were full up, and the stubborn thing went and packed her suitcase, <laughs> and somebody dropped out, and Tabitha got to go. There you go. She, she was preparing to go. What are you, how are you preparing for the blessing that's coming to you? How are you preparing for your harvest? My son needed a, some jeans to go to school because he just enrolled, I just enrolled him in school this week, and he needed pants. And I just fighting that thought in my head, and I said, well, Lord, you said that you were going to provide all my needs, and you knew this, this day would come. And today I got a phone call and said, well, Maria, I got about eight pair of jeans for your son and a couple of different <laughs> T-shirts. <laughs> The harvest was there, wasn't it? The harvest was there. That's what God does. Now then, let's look at, an, at another principle that's found in the Old Testament in 2 Kings three sixteen through 20. And he said, Thus says the Lord, make this valley full of ditches. For thus says the Lord, you shall not see wind, nor shall you see rain, yet that valley shall be filled with water, so that you, your cattle, and your animals may drink. And this is a simple matter. <laughs> Listen. And this is a simple matter in the sight of God. He will also deliver the Moabites into your hand. Also you shall attack every fortified city and every choice city. And shall cut down every good tree. And stop up every spring of water. And ruin every good piece of land with stones. Now it happened in the morning when the grain offering was offered. What happened? They sowed a seed, the grain offering, that suddenly water came by way of Edom, and the land was filled with water. He said, go dig some ditches. Go put the sickle in. 
He said, and that, now what was happening was that the, the children of Israel and of Judah, they, were, they had run out of water. They had no water. They were thirsty. And yet they were going to have to fight battles. But how are you going to fight battles without water? You have to be able to, to drink. The, the animals needed a drink. The, the people needed a drink. Nobody had any water. And so they prayed, and God said, go dig some ditches. But the water's not going to come in a storm. I said, the water's not going to come in a storm. The water's not going to come in a storm. Sometimes we think this, that water's always got to come with a storm first. And so we, we make ourselves susceptible to the storm and say, well, there's got to be a storm before there's water. Not always. Not always. And he said, it's not going to come with lightning and thunder. And then, then he gave them the instruction, not only dig the ditches, but if you see this, in other words, for the, for the miracle to happen, they had to go dig the ditches. And I want you to look at your notes now. God needs vision for the provision. Pro means in favor of. For God to be in favor of vision, you have to have a vision. If you have no vision for your future, if you know, have no vision for how God is going to supply your need, if you cannot see it, then God can't give you the provision because you lack a vision. I've been poor. I'm always going to be poor. I'm never going to have anything. Is that vision? That's poverty mentality in it. Maria, <laughs> that's right. Write the vision. Make it plain. Make it clear where everybody can see it. How many of you have written down the blessings you need from God? Learn a lesson. Write them down. Write them down. Have a vision of where you want God to take you and what you want from Him. This is not just some haphazard, get-along God that we serve. He works meticulously by 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 the same principles that he worked in the Old Testament, the principles he worked in the New Testament, he works by those same principles in 2017 because God changes not. So you can't sit on your blessed assurance <laughs> and just wait on God to pour out the blessing. Even the woman that, that needed the oil, the, the, Elisha was going to give her the oil, but he said, go get some pots. They had to do something. They had to have a plan of action. They went out, the corresponding action, and they got the pots. And he poured oil until they, he said, bring me another one. And they said, that's all of them. He would have kept pouring until they, until they, quit, run, until they quit bringing pots, and that's exactly what happened. There was a vision there. So, God will be, will be provision for the vision. God will be the provider for the vision. And I'm having to learn this lesson myself. You see, I have a vision, just like you do, for this church. We have it written down. And every January, I preach that vision. And God has given us provision for it. You say, well, it's not happening fast enough. Well, maybe we're, we haven't learned to give the way we should yet. Maybe, we're, maybe, maybe as a church, we're giving hit and miss. Not as individuals. I'm talking about as a church. Now, we give consistently to missions. But maybe we need to do, you know, and this is, this is what I'm going to be talking about with, with the board and the staff this weekend. What do we need to be doing to see this happen? What do we need to be doing? Because we have the vision, and God promised to be the provider of that vision. Right? Now, I'll get to another part of that in a minute. People perish, exactly. Without, without a vision, there is nothing for God to be in favor of. <laughs> yeah, I, I love that. Letter B, without vision, there is nothing for God to be in favor of. Have, does, have you provided anything for God to be in favor of? Okay, think about that. Without a design, a building plan, or final decision, a prayer of faith, 
firm direction or movement toward it, God can't give provision. There's got to be movement on our part. There's got to be that action. Putting the sickle in means that we put an action toward a thing as if the money was already there. Now, we did that back in January with this building program. We didn't have, you know, we still don't have the money to build the building or it'd be here, right? So we're doing it by faith. But the Lord told me in January to go out there and break ground. And we had less than $10,000 in the savings account, in the building fund. And I had some people quit. How we, why are we breaking ground when we don't even have $10,000 and it's going to take two hundred fifty dollars to $300,000 to get this thing completed? It was simple. God told me to, to, to put a plan of action. We did it. And now we have, we have spent and paid for, we have right now a little over $10,000 as we're preparing for the concrete, but we have paid over $36,000 this year already. $36,000 we've already spent, and we only had ten. How did that happen? How did that happen? Because we put some action. We broke the ground. Where did that $36,000 come from? This church. People in this church. And the tithes and offerings hasn't missed a lick. As a matter of fact, the tithes have increased. The building funds have increased. Why? Because we have, we're supplying the vision and God is supplying the provision. Okay? And that's how it works. So we see here. So don't hear number four. Number four at the bottom of the page under, under point two. Don't let your financial situation dictate the plan of God for your life. I'm going to tell you a true story. First of all, to finish that, the plan of God should dictate the money, okay? The plan of God should dictate the money. I was a, an associate pastor. I may have shared this with you. I don't know. I was an associate pastor, youth pastor, associate pastor at a church in Mobile. We was young. Uh, Ashley, we had Ashley. Uh, she was our only child at that time. And there was an elderly gentleman who was the pastor. I'm not going to call his name. And he was very wealthy. He, he did not take a salary from the church this kind of stuff, and and they paid us a little bit, not a whole lot, but paid us some. But anyway, there was a family that that came to the church, and uh, he he allowed me to pretty much be the church administrator. All he ever wanted to do, all he wanted to do was preach. That was it. I did everything else. And so I asked this family to sing. I'd heard a little bit from them, had just met them. And how many of y'all know who Shelley... Uh, yes, Shelly uh, St- uh, Sturban that we have here. Shelly Sturban that comes from Nashville and sings. And we've had her CDs. Anyway, it was her family. And they, they've written many, many songs. Well, they came and they sung. And I mean, they blew the roof off of the church. Because they were so anointed. And they had such harmony and wrote such great songs. Well, everybody just loved them. And so... Her daddy, Jerry Colston, was a crane operator in Pascagoula, Mississippi. And they were having financial issues. So he called me one day, and he said, Do you think the church could help us get on our feet a little bit? Do you know how many times I've heard that story? A bunch, a bunch. And I told him, I said, I will check with the pastor and see. Well, he happened to be there, so I walked back there. And I told him, and you know what he did? He slammed his fist down like that. He said, why is he calling you? You don't have any money. You can't help anybody. That's exactly what he told me. You don't have any money. You can't help anybody. That's what he told me. And I thought, well, if you'd pay me more, I would, but I didn't say that. <laughs> but see, he was, he was mad because the man called me instead of calling him. Okay? Well, we wound up helping him, and we became good friends with him, and we're friends to this day. Had him everywhere I've ever been, at least a part of the family. But that always stuck with me. 
till about two years ago or three when I, when I really started learning more about faith. You see, this is a faith walk for me too. And I said, I reject that word curse in Jesus' name. I reject that word curse in Jesus' name. God is my supplier. And I can help people. I don't have to be rich to be able to help people. And you don't either. And you don't either. Okay? So see, because of that word curse for many, many years, not unbeknownst, or unbeknownst to me, I allowed money or the lack of it to dictate ministry. Isn't that sad? But since I've been pastor at Restoration Christian Fellowship, well, I will complete the fourth year on February the 1st, and I'll start the fifth. I've never allowed that thought process. Never. Because God has shown me that it's not what you've got, it's what you give. It's not what you've got. It's what you give. Peter and John said, Silver and gold have we none, but such as I have, I give thee in the name of Jesus. And that's what God has taught me to do. I will give you everything I've got. I will give, I will give for this church. I will. I'm not wealthy. But I promise you this, you've get, you're getting everything I've got. Because that's what God has taught me. And you know what? I'm having the time of my life doing it. I'm enjoying it, yes. You need to look at our garage as a blessing. I need to look at our garage as a blessing. Amen. I, well, I, it is a blessing. It is a blessing. It's full of stuff. She is given, she's been giving a lot of stuff away. So, don't let your financial situation dictate the plan of God for your life. If you don't have a whole lot, don't hang your head in this church. Learn to give. If it's a penny, it's a penny. Learn to give. And God is going to bless you. Right. Don't look at nat- the natural circumstances to see how God might fill the ditch with water. The water came to Israel and Judah without a storm and without rain. Rain. 